that's it. It's all good. It's all good. Okay. But uh, Vanessa, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's an honour and a privilege to finally speak to yourself. Thank and, you. Uh, in case you don't know it, I'll just say it just now. You, you are the voice of my generation. So being com- coming up in the 90s, you know, Headbangers Ball was, was the big show. And it was before the internet. It was before YouTube and all that sort of thing. So you, you were like a... a me and my friends, own little stepping stone to the stars, asking them the questions that we wish that we could have asked, asked them and just sitting down and chilling with them. So it's, it's a privilege to speak to you and, and uh, I'm glad that you agreed to come on and make some time for myself. But before we get going with anything, uh, how are you actually doing? Well, first of all, thank you for such a wonderful uh, intro. That that means so much to, to hear that from you um, because obviously we're talking... Decades have gone by (laughs) since uh, MTV Headbangers Ball finished. It came off the air in 1997. Um, But yes, I'm doing great, thank you. And as we'll probably talk about on the podcast, um, I'm back on the metal scene with the new music TV show. So real music TV is back. Yes, thank God. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, Vanessa, what I like to do with everyone that comes on, as I go back to the very beginning, so for yourself, where were you originally brought up? Well, I I had an interesting um, childhood because my father was in the armed forces. He was a, um, a pilot in the RAF. And typically, um, for a military family, we moved all over the world. And I was talking the other day to somebody and I recalled that... Um, I had been to 17 different schools in 10 years. So it was a very itinerant um, existence, but um, I got to see, you know, a lot of the world. He was based in the Middle East for a little while. Um, And yeah, um, it was very interesting sort of childhood because I saw so many different things in so many different countries and so many different towns and cities. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you do hear of people similar to yourself being brought up that way and uh, they say that it, it, it creates a sort of inner confidence because you've got you move so often you've got to make friends quickly and you know it can suit you well for later in life when you you need a bit of confidence if you're trying to get a job or you're doing this or that or the next thing well exactly that because yeah you know I was in a school for six months and then my dad got posted somewhere else yeah. and had to up sticks and move so yeah I think um, it had its advantages uh, and of course there are always disadvantages with situations yeah. like that um, and uh, I can't say that I, I regret any of it because the trail eventually led to me becoming a TV presenter yeah. so um, yeah everything the stars aligned for me um which i'm forever grateful for and see when you were very young were you into music from a very young age was that something that was introduced to you early on by maybe your parents not so much my parents but um friends i first started listening to heavy rock uh, and um sort of fairly light metal uh when i was about 13 or 14 um I felt quite like I was quite an insular person. I'm quite happy in my own company. Um, I'm not a massively social person. And I found uh, music was a great uh, release. Um, And, you know, I think when you're growing up, all of us, we go through times where, where we're confused or we are struggling to find our identity as an adult and I think that's what attracted me to rock music because it was so it it comes from the heart and it's very very authentic and it's born out of a lot of the time actual human suffering and pain and you know it's something that um it it just really resonated with me uh while I was growing up I was trying to find my way way in the world and you know my parents are very authoritarian um my father came from a very disciplined background where you know he had massive responsibilities um and you know he he was very strict and I think to some degree I I did rebel against that um and I think music was part of finding out you know what sort of person I was and the person and the adult that I wanted to be 
when you were then 12 or 13, who, who was some of the the bands that you initially discovered for yourself that kind of put you on that, that road? I would say it was the likes of Iron Maiden uh, and ACDC, um, those kind of bands. Do you remember what the first album was that you ever bought with your own money? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I can't. No, no, sorry. What about, do you remember the first um, concert you ever went to? I do, and it's not not going to be well received by your viewers. <laughs> I, went to, I went to a Wham concert. Right. <laughs> You've got to be honest, though, they were enormous in the 80s. Well, they were, and I had a friend that wanted to go, and I, I'd never been to a concert, uh, and, you know, I was interested to try it and see see what it was like. Yeah, and it, it does change. I've spoke to, to, to lots of people about this, that if you're at home, you, you might have the best stereo system, you might have great earphones, but um, there's something different about going into an arena and I always remember the first time I went and when we were walking into the arena, the, the roadies were still setting up. So they were doing the sound check on stage and even just hitting the kick drum and you, you feel it in your chest. You, you don't get that from being at home. And then obviously once the show starts, you've got, you know, it might have all the fancy lights and that. But if you've got another 20,000 people singing the same, the same song, you know, there's something magical about it that you just... You can't explain to someone they've actually got to go and witness it for themselves. You have. And it's such an incredible energy mm -hmm. in, in a live um, performance. And it's a bit like a really good film. Um, a really good film takes you out of your own life yeah. for two hours. I remember when I went to see Titanic, <laughs> I was in Mexico and I was on holiday. And um, I went to see the film Titanic and unbeknownst to me they had an interval about halfway through right. so i was totally totally immersed <laughs> in this film and yeah. the sinking of the titanic and yeah. all of a sudden the lights went up and people stood up and went to get refreshments and, and so on and I, honestly i had about 20 seconds where i i had to get back into my own existence and i think that's one of the powerful things about music and when you go to concerts it just takes you out of your own life um and it's very freeing for your for your mind um and it's healthy yeah it wouldn't have been too healthy last night because I, I was in glasgow and i've seen cavalera conspiracy so my back to oh. and igor and a uh, there was a few people here. I don't know if they'd be feeling too good this morning because uh, they got thrown about like they were a wee rag doll. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's all part of the experience. <laughs> it was, yeah. So, obviously, you, you went through high school and that. How did you get into the... I mean, you, I assume, obviously, Headbangers Ball was not your first job. So, how did you kind of get onto the, the road of going down the route that you ended up in that position? Well, it was... A, Again, the, you know, the stars aligned. The universe worked its magic for me, I guess. I mean, I did do um, hospital radio as a volunteer right. when I was maybe 18 or 19. Um, but my very first job, I, this might be a bit of an exclusive for you, I'm not sure. Um, I worked, I qualified as a hospital technician. Right. So I worked actually in the NHS as a technician. Um, and I did that for a number of years and I qualified um, as a senior technician uh but I, I felt there was something missing from my life um and i wanted to move up to london and experience the full experience of yep. living in a capital city and going to gigs um so i moved up to london and i got a job uh as a receptionist in a video production company and that created interest for me in film and television and media um, and I, I had quite a few different jobs um, as production assistant and things like that uh, and then one day I'd been managing a band and we'd been up 
all weekend. They've done two gigs up in Leeds uh, and Manchester. And then we had some studio downtime at like four o'clock in the morning where a studio very kindly gave us four hours free time. So I'd literally not slept all weekend. I came back to London and I I got a call. Um, I was working for an agency. I got a call and and the lady said, oh, Vanessa, um, there's a one day job um, at MTV Europe. Uh, to do some production assistant work. Do you want it? Right. And I said, it, you know, I looked out the window, it's pouring with rain. And I said, do you know what? I, I, I've just been up all weekend. I'm absolutely exhausted. I, I don't really want to go. And she said, Vanessa, I'm going to insist that you go because MTV's just started in London and it's it's got a lot of opportunity there. And I think you'd really like it. So thank God that she pushed me because I did go. And at the end of the day, they said, oh, Vanessa, we really like you. Can you stay on for another two weeks? Which I did. Um, And then after the two weeks, I I got a permanent position. Um, I was originally the executive producer's assistant. Uh, And then I, when they started the very first metal show on MTV uh, Europe, it was called um, MTV's Metal Hammer. And I got the job as production assistant on that show. Uh, And then I just gradually worked my way up um, behind the scenes. And then I got the presenter job. And that was in 1989. Did Did you always want to go from behind the camera in front of it or was it just one of those things that that accidentally happened I think you know I remember when I had my interview with the careers person at school I said to her I want to be a cameraman or camera woman yeah. and she looked at me and she was very shocked and you know in in back in the day when I was leaving school there were there were two streams you either became a doctor a dentist, a vet, a barrister, a solicitor, something like that, where you yeah. needed very heavy qualifications, or you became somebody's wife <laughs> and you did domestic science and knitting. And, and, and that neither of those were for me. And, you know, I kind of fell between the two streams. Um, but, you know, once I got up to London, it was it was a whole new world for me. And when I got to the MTV studios and started seeing how television was produced and seeing the stars come in and, you know, working behind the scenes. Um, yeah, it ignited a desire in me to go as far as I could. And I did like, um, you know, the idea of, of being on, on television. I mean, not, not many people wouldn't like the idea of that. You know, it's a, a chance in a lifetime, a job in, in a billion. So I was very, very fortunate. And, you know, I'm eternally grateful um, for it this very day. Who, who came up with the, the format of the show? Because what, what I liked about Headbangers Ball Show was, I, I mean, if you, you, you pick any band... And you, especially nowadays, you type into YouTube the band name and interview, and they do a million interviews, and they sit in a studio and they ask, you know, the same questions, they answer the same questions. Sorry, what I loved was it was a lot. It was almost like two friends going down the pub just to have a chat. Like you would sit on the grass, if, you know, with it, if it was a nice day, you'd sit in the grass with the band and you just sit, and it was like two old pals having a chat rather than it being like this. In- interview Q&A format which was it made it a lot more comfortable to watch was that something that you kind of it just naturally came about or was it sort of directed in in that sort of format well that's the ultimate compliment to me that you said that thank you so much because I, I wanted it to be like uh, two pals having a chat. And I felt such a responsibility to the fans because the fans know way more about their favourite band than I do. Uh, And I wanted to be like a conduit to uh, between the band and the fans to help the bands express themselves fully and explain their music, their lyrics, their live performances, their videos. Um, And it kind of actually went against the grain at MTV because I was told in the beginning that a a, a VJ is somebody who's nice to look at, who wears the latest fashions and, you know, 
I don't know. It, it was it, it, a VJ seemed to be more about the personality of the VJ is the most important thing, and I didn't agree with that for rock. Um, and I actively went against that. And you know, it's I don't think I can deny or maybe you know I'd say MTV didn't like me as a presenter. They, I think it was they, probably- they wanted me to be um, more of a. I don't know, a, a, a character or something. Yeah. And, you know, I said to them at the time, it's, it's, it's not about that. It's about being a conduit for the, for the, between the fans and the band. So, um, yeah, they didn't always like me um, a, 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 as, a, as a presenter. It was probably quite refreshing, I, I would imagine, for the bands themselves because they probably got, it's, it probably is very boring doing a lot of these interviews where you get asked the same questions. It probably was quite refreshing on their part to have a different format of, of an interview. Uh, but, the, I mean, they all seem to like it. But, I mean, going back, I mean, I was brought up in the 80s and the, ni- the 90s, so right before um, the, the internet hit. And I tried to <laughs> explain to my daughter, she's 18, and I was trying to explain to her how... In, Important these shows were back in the day, and it's hard for her to get her head around because everything's available now. Everything, yeah, it's all on demand. Yep. Yeah, I mean, she if she likes an artist, she knows everything about them. Mm. You know, just by going into Google, going onto YouTube. You know, it, it was this insight into the band and their personalities that nowadays people are just probably so used to it. But back then, it, it was great. But I took a wee note of some of the bands. So, got Metallica, Pantera, Slayer, Machine Head, White Zombie, Megadeth, Biohazard, Therapy, Iron Maiden, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Soundgarden, Sepultura. The, the list goes on and on and on. All my favourite bands, right? <laughs> well, was, we, were, we were lucky to be in an era of such incredible talent and music um and so many of those artists are still going today and there's still so many songs that i i listen to and they they are completely timeless they, yeah. they could they sound as fresh today as they did 30 years ago um and i think just going back to the the interviews i i i respected the artists and their talent so much that i didn't want to ask them dumbass questions because yeah. it just showed, to, my, to my mind that shows a lack of respect uh, and you know when I first started they didn't have a clue who I was um, but you know I gradually got to um, have mutual respect from them I guess you could say and um, I don't know if you know this but when Kurt Cobain committed suicide um, there was a lot of pressure on other Seattle bands to do interviews and, and yeah. say how they felt about it and um, Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam, after a few weeks, he eventually agreed to do one worldwide interview that would be syndicated to everybody that wanted it. Yeah. And he chose me to yeah. do the interview. And I was flown out to Boston and went um, backstage. And it was a very emotional interview, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, I had to respect Eddie because I didn't want to push him, uh, you know, to try and get some juicy tidbit or something, yeah, yeah. you know, some clickbait thing. So I, I was very sensitive. I wanted to be very sensitive with him. Um, and, I, you know, I guess some people, some producers might have said, oh, you know, you should have pushed him harder to say how he was feeling or whatever. But it was a lovely interview. It was very emotional. And at the end, he hugged me and he said, thank you so much for your your sensitivity. Uh, and actually, that's more important to me than MTV going, yeah, Vanessa, you've got a great interview. So, yeah, it was all about, I tried to make it about the artists. Yeah, but I think there definitely was a respect on, on both levels. And, and part of that was, and I don't mean this in, in, a, bad way, but in a bad way, but it wasn't just some a nice looking presenter flirting with the mm. with the guys. You were talking to them about things that meant something to them and it meant something to the people watching. It wasn't just, you know, a wasted opportunity just asking silly questions or, you know, and, and I think in hindsight when you look back on it, the way that it was done 
was exactly the way it should have been done. And for those in charge who maybe disagreed at the time, they would probably admit themselves, maybe in hindsight, looking back, actually, they were probably wrong about that as well. Mm. I think, you know, MTV at the end of the day was a corporation. Yeah. Um, Corporations are driven by money and balance sheets. um, And, you know, they had a very specific idea of what the channel should be like. Uh, and you know it was it was interesting because we had these themed weekends on on MTV, um, and there, there was a rock weekend. Yeah. And I put my hand up and said, "Can I present the rock weekend?" You know, outside of MTV yeah. Headbangers Ball. And the executive producer said, "No, Vanessa, we don't we don't want you presenting it." And I said, mm, "Why is that?" And she said, "Well." When people turn on, they see you and they think rock and metal, so they're going to turn off. But if they turn on and they see Bon Jovi with a normal, you know, everyday VJ, they'll think, oh, I do quite like this, and they'll stay tuned. And I thought, hmm, okay. (laughs) Not quite sure what to make of that, but, you know, I was very... uh, I was very much in my little two-hour slot on a Sunday evening, shall we say. It's funny, I had um, a few episodes ago, I had radio presenter Tom Russell on, uh, the godfather of rock, and he, he's got some amazing stories to tell, <coughs> excuse me, and he was saying that um, he, the way he got into radio, it just wouldn't ex- work nowadays, it wouldn't exist, this offer, but uh, he became friends with, I, can't, I don't know if it was Clyde Radio or one of the big radio stations up here in Scotland, he would got to know the boss of the radio station uh, and he'd said to him a few times in a few different meetings why don't you play rock music this is probably back in the 70s and he'd said oh it's a passing phase it's not going to not going to last and uh, but although he didn't get it he says a week later he phoned him up he says I've been thinking about it and I don't like the music I don't think it's going to last but I'm willing to give you a shot so if you fancy it, come down to the radio station. We'll show we'll show you how to work everything, and I'll give you a one hour slot on a Friday night. And he says he had a six week trial, and that was him there for twenty two years doing the rock radio show um, through in Glasgow. And every single big band in the last forty years he interviewed, and and you know the person's wrong, but I've said I don't even think somebody would would take a chance nowadays on something like that, which is a shame. You know, mm-hmm. he didn't get it, but he trusted this other person to mm-hmm. give him a shot. And he, I don't know, I, I kind of think with yourself, it's, you know, the magic. I don't know if it, if it's um, just looking back, but you kind of feel like, I don't know if it would work nowadays. It's just so different. And I, I just say everything's really just driven by money. It is and always has been. Um, But I do think that the balance of power has shifted from the record companies and the media to the fans because of social media and platforms like YouTube and Spotify and Instagram and TikTok. And, you know, fans um, are choosing the bands now. And rather than the record companies choosing who we would be exposed to, it's actually the fans um, you know, getting behind a band and creating a groundswell of like a massive audience yep. that is getting bands signed now. So there's many yep. artists and bands around now that started out just with a following on social media and they've come to the attention of the record companies through having a massive following and they've got signed as a result of that. So, you know, I think it has actually shifted more power to, to the fans now because they can, you know, vote with their mouse who, which bands yeah. they like. See, of all those bands, you know, I mentioned a lot of bands there. There's, there's hundreds more, but who were some of the, the bands that, just for you personally, you were excited to, to meet, to, to get to interview. Was there ones that, particular ones that you were a fan of yourself? Oh, of course, there was. And, you know, I tried not to show favouritism because my taste is different to everybody else's. And it wasn't, you know, about my taste. It was about a reflection of what people wanted yeah. through album sales, through through uh, requests, through ticket sales, you know, everything. Um, so, you know, there's there's so many artists that, 
it was such a privilege to meet. Um, I would definitely say, you know, bands like Sepultura, uh, Machine Head, Korn, uh, Deftones, um, those kind of bands. I, I, they, I was like massive fans of them. Um, but I think I just loved them so much because they were just so authentic. Yeah. There wasn't anything um, fake about them. Uh, a- yeah. So, um, you know, I loved, you know, even, you know, Poison were great fun to mm-hmm. be around. Yeah. Um, uh, who else? Uh, just so, just so many. Um, Kiss were fun. Um, it's easier to say actually the ones that were kind of difficult than the ones oh. that were. Oh, Skid Row, of course. We mustn't forget Skid Row. What was going to say? Hilarious. What I was going to say was there's that saying of don't ever meet your your heroes, you know, because you you'd be disappointed. And uh, it's not. I'm not obviously looking for naming and shaming, but what, what I'm. Abs- were, was there any that were disappointing to me or, or were the majority of them actually just as people when the camera was off they were actually okay people they were, they were nice normal yes the vast 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 majority of the bands and artists I met were absolutely lovely exactly the same off camera as they were on camera um, there, were, there were one or two who um, maybe were a little bit arrogant um and there were one or two who i felt i was a lot more enthusiastic about what they were doing than they were um which yeah. was interesting but you know the the i mean just people like chris cornell of soundgarden what a lovely lovely human being yeah. uh, and so talented um and sadly no longer with us as there, as many are not um you know it's just just a privilege to meet these people um, and just spend a little bit of time and get to know them a little bit. And then, of course, to see see the live shows as well while I was there. Um, yeah. Aerosmith I had a lot of fun with. I went on stage with them at Monsters of Rock in Rio. Yeah. And they allowed me to stand inside their, what was called their Kabuki curtain, which was the transparent curtain that yeah. came, that was on the stage. And then the curtain dropped down and they were suddenly exposed if you liked the audience and they said oh come in the kabuki curtain with us and i said oh can i bring the camera and they said yeah of course and steve and tyler painted like a little teardrop on my face and he said come on then so i went in the kabuki curtain and honestly the noise was it was like an air aircraft take a jet jet engine yeah, yeah. it was so loud and then this curtain dropped down and suddenly i could see like 40,000 people it was absolutely incredible so you know it's all very very fun times um and I'm you know I've started this new show on stacks now um called heavy metal heydays um and it's essentially taking a walk down memory lane to the kind of glory days of MTV's headbangers ball but you know it's it's just so lovely to revisit it all because so many years have passed. We're talking three decades have yeah. passed. And I'm working with my old producer right. um, from MTV, Sarah, and she's always saying, oh, Vanessa, do you remember when, when we went to Kalamazoo with Pantera? And yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, of course, we had such fun. And, you know, yeah. I've got a segment in that show called Metal Memory. And every, every, every edition, I just pick out one memory from back in the day something that really you know it's one of those stories that you'll tell at the bar every time just really just funny things or insightful things or unusual things that happened and so I do my metal memory segment and um I've just uh had my first two guests on the show and my first guest was Scott Gorham from Thin Lizzy and my second guest was Biff Byford from Saxon so you know and when I met up with them again, the years melted away. Yeah. You know, it was like, oh, Vanessa, how are you? And, you know, and we were straight back in. And um, the interviews I've done with them, I'm so happy with them. They're, they're again, they are like two old pals talking to yeah. each other. Uh, they're very relaxed. And certainly with Biff, um, I think I saw a slightly different side to him. Um, which I hadn't really noticed before. So, uh, yeah, that's going from strength to strength. Um, my 
previous show to Scott Gorham was downloaded 150,000 times. Oh. And the, that's in the Baltics um, where it can be viewed. But it's now on Samsung TV. Um, and I'm on episode seven now. Um, I've right. got um, Benji from Skindred as my next guest. Um, and, you know, I hope to have, I've got uh, Joey Tempest lined up. I've got hopefully Slash lined up. So, yeah, just going back to my roots, really. Yeah. Um, and we're filming it at the Karma Sanctum Hotel in London, which is Iron Maiden's um, hotel. Don't know if anybody knows of it, but it's the most awesome rocking hotel. All the bands stay there when they're in town. There's a bar and restaurant. There's um, an upstairs there's a roof terrace with a jacuzzi and um yeah you walk along the corridors and you'll you'll bump into a, a famous a famous face for sure so um yeah i'm very much back in back in the swing again you, you'd mentioned um, pantera and, and that's always a sad one because you know your likes of your your kurt cobain your your chris cornell i'm sure they were, they were both great guys but they obviously had their inner demons and unfortunately you know, that's what caused caused the end of them. The one with Dimebag's really sad because it was some some other person that, that took it. You know, it, it wasn't his own doing. You know, right. he, was, yeah. he was still on stage rocking out, just loving life. And yeah. uh, I'm sure they've still been rocking to this day. Uh, yeah, had, he would. He would. It's, ter- uh, it's, it's absolutely, it's just incredibly sad. Yeah. Um, you know, it's heartbreaking. And then obviously Vinny as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's so many that aren't with us anymore, but they've left such an amazing legacy of music. Yeah. Um, you know, and we can still still listen to the records and still watch the videos. And at Stacks, we've got mostly live performances, so uh, you know, it really is high energy live performances in the show. And I, I think that kind of gives it an extra special kind of feel because. You know, gigs, I think, are one of those things that, you know, they, they create memories that you, you never forget. Yeah. And yeah. they can, you can just hear a song and then you can think, it, it literally is like time travel. It takes you back to a gig where you were at and you met so-and-so or you saw your old friend that you hadn't seen for 10 years. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Just, it's like that. It's just wonderful. What's the reason for coming back to it now? Was it just the right opportunity? Was Stax the right avenue for you to go down was it just as simple as that yeah I'd never really thought about it um you know it's so long ago and so much has changed and you know I didn't really think I could be relevant again um you know let's let's be real you know I'm old enough to be somebody's grandmother now and um I'd never really thought about it. I'd obviously changed direction. As many of you know, I got into yeah. property investment and my husband and I um, co-founded what is now the biggest landlord and property investor community in the UK. Yep. So um, we have this business. Um, I do a lot of consultancy in the property sector. Um, you know, the government, I've done government consultations and things like that. Uh, I won Influencer of the Year at the Property Press yeah. in 2022. So I've kind of very much got into another sector. Um, and then, you know, completely out of the blue, uh, the executive producer at Stax got in touch with me um, probably about, I don't know, eight or nine months ago, maybe yeah. a bit longer, and said, um, Vanessa, we, we're going to do this uh, this rock show. Um, we'd like you to present it. You'll be our first ever presenter. Right. And I thought about it for a nanosecond. I went, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> um, and then we had another meeting and we worked out the format of the show yeah. um, and discussed all of, of the kind of production elements of it. And uh, I asked if I could bring my old producer from MTV back in because she's still 100% immersed in the scene. She can get any guests that we want. Yeah. Um, and they agreed. So, uh, you know, we've we've uh, just dived in and it's just going from strength to strength. It's currently yeah. once a month, but, um, you know, if it continues to do well, it may move to twice a month. Uh, and there's another show that I might be presenting on Stacks as well. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's uh, very exciting times. And it's, like I say, it, it's just great to be back. I've met so many of my old colleagues from MTV as well, because they've been coming um, to the 
uh, the uh, venue with guests and whatnot. Yeah. So, you know, again, just hooking up with friends from way back in the day. Yeah. Some would argue that you should maybe never have went in the first place, but obviously you've had a successful year with the property side of it. And then, as you say, you've came back to this as well. But we've obviously been um, talking a lot about the music, so we're going to end things on a few fun questions for you. So, Vanessa, imagine you've got a time machine. You can go back in time anywhere in the world. What's the one concert that you wish that you could have attended? Oh, my God. That's that's just a very, very difficult question. Um... Big or small? Mm, that's that's really hard. Um, I I probably would have liked to have gone to Woodstock and but maybe um, experienced that. Yeah. Because that was the birthplace of many great bands. Yep. And I think it was a real kind of, you know, forerunner. Uh, yep. in concerts it was a um, moment in history yep and yep. very much about freedom of expression which is very much part of what music's about so yeah I would I would probably go back to to a Woodstock okay um, as you know there is millions and millions of amazing songs that have been recorded over the years what's the one song that you you would like to have maybe been sat at the recording desk watching them record it in the studio <laughs> wow, that's a tough one. Um, it, I, I don't want to offend anyone, anybody because I can only choose one. Yeah. Um, but it would, I think, maybe Corn Blind right. because um, so so different, yeah, so innovative, um, and quirky. Yeah, different is the word, but not in a bad way. Yeah. Just so different from anything that had been before. And it's yep. something. And there was all these other bands similar to them, but they're still at the top of the pack when it comes to bands of that kind of sound. Yep. I think that just says it all, really, because they've, you know, they've stood the test of time and they're still, they're still going. Yep. Um and yeah, they were they were really like a breath of fresh air. And it was actually um Machine Head who told me about corn. So you've got to listen to this band corn. Uh <laughs> so I did, and I thought they were absolutely awesome. Uh and a bunch of very um very nice down to earth guys as well. Cool. And uh, last question for you. Uh, Mount Rushmore, for yourself, who are the four bands or musicians? That for yourself, whether it be songwriting, whether it be performance, whether it just be the overall package, who's the four at the top of the pile for yourself? Wow, you ask hard questions <laughs> uh, with no warning. Um, I would say it would be Queensryche. Yeah. Soundgarden. Yep. Um, Sepultura. Yep. And oh, it's hard. It's so hard to choose. There's so many. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe Machine Head. Yeah, I was going to be controversial and say old Sepultura or new Sepultura, but we won't, we won't go down that argument. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went to see Cavalera Conspiracy last night. And that you, you heard people obviously in the audience talking about it, but I've also got tickets to go and see Sepultura later in the year as well. Uh, you know, it's not nice what happened, but I like there's there's two bands now. Out mm. of. Well, I probably ruined my street cred by telling you that I've got tickets to see Bruce Springsteen in July, um, and it's not because I'm a massive fan of the music, although I do like his music. It's that I read his biography and I was so impressed by him as a human being yep. um, and his determination and his integrity about everything that he does. Yep. And, you know, there's some bands um, that probably aren't going to be with us that much longer. Um, I mean, Bruce himself is in his 70s now. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I've been taking the opportunity to, uh, you know, see some of them. Mm. 
maybe you know who knows it might be madonna's last tour for for instance it's funny um, you say that about bruce springsteen because i'm i'm a big heavy metal rocker guy i watched an interview with simon cowell you know mm-hmm. mr x factor and obviously being a rock person you don't like that it's, it's pop music and all that what an interesting person from a personal point of view and mm-hmm. business point of view mm-hmm. his, his, his story is actually incredible as much as I don't like the, the, the show, I, I'm, you know, I'm not a fan of pop music, but what an interesting life he has had. And from a business point of view, it's like incredible what he's actually done. Oh, it, it is utterly incredible what he's done because yeah. it's not just in the UK. He's achieved so much well, in, he's in the United Earth. States yeah. as well. And yeah. he's created... Uh, television formats that have been syndicated all over the world. He's an extremely clever person and, and businessman. So yeah. Um, the great thing about him, though, is that he's learned from his mistakes because he's made plenty of them as well, and and he's open about it. You know, he's got a lot of success now, but in order to get that success, he had to learn from his failures. Well, everybody does, and one of my favourite sayings is, "There is no win or lose if you win and learn." Yeah. So, you know, every every day is a learning opportunity for us, um, and you know, we I like to sometimes say that the universe sends us lessons to learn, and if we don't learn, that lesson is then pushed at us a little bit harder, yeah. and if we still don't learn, then we get a little bit of a kicking so yeah. yeah i mean every every day is an opportunity um to learn and be be a better human human being um and uh you know it, it's great uh when you see artists that have stayed true to themselves and have treated the people around them with respect and have kept their feet on the ground yeah. because living the life that they do it's and I obviously I've I've ex- experienced that that life being on the road. I've flown on Metallica's private jet. I've been out to dinner with Bon Jovi in Italy. You know I've seen the attention they get, the people pandering to their every whim. You know if you're living that existence, it's a little bit of a bubble. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you know egos can get out of control. Feet can leave the ground. And, um, you know, 99.9% of the artists that, that, and bands that I met, um, that they were, they still had their feet on the ground. They were grateful for what they'd achieved. Um, they loved the fans. Uh, you know, I think a good example of that is Iron Maiden. Um, you know, everything they do, they're thinking, what can we do for the fans? What, how are the fans going to see us when we arrive at the airport? How are the fans going to see us when we walk from the car to the, yeah. the hotel? You know, they're so, so loyal to their fans. Um, and, and that's just so wonderful to see um, because the music is a true connection between the, the, the artist and, and, and the fans. And without um, the fans, they, they don't have anything. I mean, I've, I've actually been lucky enough to... to to meet up with Iron Maiden and go out for drinks with them. And as you say, and this was probably back in, it was maybe 20 years ago now, but I mean, you know, just as, you know, one of the top bands and they were the most normal guys you would ever meet. And uh, chatting away to you on the same level, Hmm? you know, just about everything, anything. But uh, Vanessa, thank you for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. For anybody, obviously, looking up your your um, Stax TV, StaxTV.com. Yeah, uh, Stax TV um, and Stax.com. And it's also uh, on Samsung TV as well. And it is available in the UK. It was launched, I think, at the end of uh, April or May. So very yeah. uh, recently launched into the UK. Yeah. So you can watch it if you're in the UK on um, Samsung TV or you can go on to Stax, um, and I think it's going to be available uh, in the UK at the moment. I think it's just in the Baltics, but it's growing all the time. Stax signing up new deals and new platforms, yeah. so hopefully it um, it will it will spread again. Yeah. So everybody needs to check it out. But until then, thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, and uh, I wish you all the success with the new venture. 
Oh, well, thank you so much, Ian. I've really enjoyed talking to you and you had some great questions and um, <laughs> you're a really great interviewer. Um, it's just just lovely to talk to you and hear of your your sort of stories as well. So um, thank you for, for asking me on and, um, you know, keep it heavy. Until next time, thank you. Cheers. All right, bye. bye.